that did all of that planning, these folks that are running around in these like yellow looking shirts, the volunteers, and all of these folks that are around us that are serving us right now, just thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Also, I uh, want to um, make sure that I'm calling out, uh, you know, some of the other supporters. Um, how am I doing juggling these pages? How about uh, Seventh Generation, uh, Northfield Savings Bank, uh, Parmelo Real Estate, the Vermont Community Foundation, uh, also with uh, some support from other folks like Dillo.com. I'm going to miss some, but I just want to say some because they actually invested in what it is we're doing. It's fair. We should call them out. Uh, Switchback, Darn Tough, VSCU, uh, si uh, Citizen Cider, uh, the, the YMCA of Greater Burlington, and so, 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 so many more. So uh, thank you all for your support. Uh, thank you for what you have done uh, to make this first um, Juneteenth uh, celebration policy possible, making this first Juneteenth celebration possible. Now, I wanted to also add to that, uh, for those of you who didn't know, that the Racial Justice Alliance uh, will also be hosting First African Landing Day uh, for the first year, uh, for the third year uh, here coming up on the fourth Saturday, I believe it's the 21st of August. Uh, that venue is yet to be determined. I know our time is short, but this will be the third year that we've done that, and that is to 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 remind folks of the the resilience, the the contribution, the um, the experiences, the um, the power of Black folks, uh, starting from 1619 at what was then Point Comfort, when 20 or odd so black folks jumped off a ship called the White Lion in what is now modern day Hampton, Virginia. So we tell that story and we also invite a lot of folks to come out and be a part of that experience. We had a blast at Intervale last year. Uh, we were at Studio 180 a year prior. So I'm, I'm curious to find out where we're gonna be this year. Time will tell. So we will have a number of other activities happening in the parks. Uh, I know we've got one called Nation in Crisis coming up uh, June 26th. Uh, we're, uh, for the BIPOC community, we've been sharing Out of Darkness. Uh, we'll be doing the third part of that uh, over at the soda plant. Um, that is uh, July, uh, July 1st. And we always do what we refer to as First Friday. Uh, that's when a lot of BIPOC folks are getting around and talking and, and talking about opportunity and talking about empowerment and many, many other things. So that being said, uh, what I want to tell you now uh, is, is um, as we go into this Juneteenth ce uh, celebration, we must uh, acknowledge, we must acknowledge a few things. Um, it is hard to process, it's hard to wrap one's head around in terms of how we got to this place. What do I mean by that? How do we got to this place? What we're working with here is, is we're working with an awakening of a nation where some of us are just coming to terms with understanding that there was um, a time, there was a period in time, where in which um, there, there was a, um, a nation called the United States that actually institutionalized the, um, the apparatus of slavery into this nation. So it was, it was constitutionalized slavery for this nation. And I think a lot of folks, I, they, I think they forget to teach us that in school, is, is that, no, no, wait a minute, it was in the Constitution. It, and then for those of us who did learn that, thank God, I think I did, um, but it's, it's hard to get uh, to a point uh, to where we're also you know, understanding some of the other nuances that went into that. And I think chronolo chr 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 chronology is probably one of the things that I've struggled with most uh, in terms of not just what happened, um, but also when it happened. So hopefully we can unpack a couple things today. Um, again, I'm Mark Hughes, Executive Director of the Racial Justice Alliance. Our mission is to sustain, to secure sustainable power, ensure agency, and provide security uh, for, for American descendants of slavery while embracing their history and preserving their culture. That's what we do. Uh, how we do that is in four separate ways, platforms and initiatives, outreach and education, community engagement and support, and cultural empowerment, which is why I'm here. Now, back to that chronology. 
Here's what I've come to figure out. Uh, in July of July 8th, 1777, um, a constitution was written. It was the Vermont State Constitution. The Vermont State Constitution was written uh, 8th of July, uh, 1777. And in that constitution, there are two exception clauses. Now, you must, you must be reminded that the state of Vermont was yet to be even a state at that time because we would not incorporate in, until I think it was 91. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, 1791 or something like that. Um, so you have um, what would come in a couple of years is the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States arrived on the scene 17, 17 September uh, 1787. And then, of course, um, there are a lot of things to fill in those blanks about things that have happened over time. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to just contextualize, at least factually, when we know certain things happen. We can argue about a lot of other things, but much of them are known. Um, but what we know is, is that the Civil War started on April 1st, uh, 1861. I'm just painting a, pr a picture for you. I'm just trying to get us all to get along this chrono chronological uh, mindset. Well, the Emancipation Proclamation was actually signed in January 1st, 1863. So this was almost about two years into the war, and the war would last four years, right? Um, two years into the war, it was signed. So, January 31st, 1865, January 31st, 1865, what we know is, is that the 13th Amendment was signed. The 13th Amendment. And within the 13th Amendment, it said slavery is prohibited except for the punishment of a duly convicted crime. So what that left is, is that left us a, a little bit of a loophole. Now, one would say, why is that necessary? Well. Um, you got to understand, there's a, lot, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's complicated, you know, because, you know, you had these, you know, warring factions or folks who believed different things, and they were um, adversarial toward one another, probably a little bit since they killed each other. 620,000 people died in the Civil War uh, because they couldn't quite agree about one major little thing, slavery. So... At this time during the war, the proclamation was actually pronounced to recruit some of the southern black folks to be a part of the Union Army and to be able to incentivize them to run. That's what was going on at that time. So just so we get the context of the Emancipation Proclamation right, although we're talking about chronology, as long, as long as we get the context right, it's important. So what happened after that? Um, the 13th Amendment in 1865, that's that loophole, the emancipation in 1863. Civil War ends in 1865, April. Uh, President Lincoln is assassinated less than a week later. John Wilkes Booth says the South will be avenged after he killed him. Sounds like a hate crime to me. And um, here we are, Juneteenth. There you go. <laughs> That's what I came to tell you. So, no, it's not what I came to tell you. So what you see is you see the Civil War as being central to this conversation, of course. We see the Civil War being central. Uh, one of the things that, you know, that we go into this conversation understanding is, is that no, slavery was never abolished. And I hate to, you know, stop by and tell you that today because slavery existed from, you know, 1887 at the beginning of the Constitution, all the way, uh, 1787, all the way to 1865, upon which time the 13th Amendment uh, allowed it to continue in another form with that particular loophole that I told you about. That loophole has been in the 13th Amendment since 1865, making us the, the, a nation that has never been without slavery, ever. So why is that significant? I don't know. I just kind of wanted to know. Nobody told me in school. Um, so what I came by to tell you is, is 
is that there's this clause in the Constitution, and it says this, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except for, Cleophas, I think I might need one of those papers back. N neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except for the punishment of a duly convicted crime, where if the party shall have been, it says, except for the punishment of a crime, where if the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any subject to their jurisdiction. It's so exhausting to look at that. To understand that, yes, we, we are, in fact, that. But you're probably saying, everybody's walking around saying, man, that's ridiculous, bunkers. Because what's going on is, is we got this thing going on and nobody knew about it. And those guys are kind of dumb because they didn't even know about it. And, you know, and, and it's like, what in the heck were people thinking? You know, why in the heck did it take almost two and a half years to get the word down to Galveston? And um, how is it that, you know, nobody even knows about this 13th Amendment thing? Maybe some people caught on to it because Michelle Alexander in the movie 13th. <clears throat> Maybe some people may have began to understand it, but literally what this was for, what it was, the purpose of this, it was a compromise that nobody ever talks about. And I always like to say, whenever white people say that they're compromising, it's always bad for black people. Um, and I use uh, the Compromise of 1877 as, a, as an example of that when uh, you had Rutherford B. Hayes and James Tilden and... Uh, it turned out that Rutherford B. Hayes, he got the White House, Tilden didn't, but they pulled the troops from the South and, and um, Reconstruction collapsed. There you go. Uh, there are other compromises that were made along the way. Um, back to my point, though. What I came by to do is, is really to challenge Vermont and to challenge us, because really it's not, it's not so bonkers. It's not so out there that people could have gone for two and a half years uh, without knowing this. After all, many people in this park have gone their entire lives and not known that the Constitution of the state of Vermont has two exception clauses in it. And that no, we are not the state that first abolished slavery. They cannot coexist. You cannot have English in the first paragraph of our Constitution that clearly states that there are two exceptions uh, for, for slavery and at the same time say that we're the first state to abolish slavery. And I think that is, a, that is really a, you know, incredibly important hard stop because therein lies the rub, the, the rub rather, because what we're hearing today, where, you know, you got this critical race theory nonsense and all this other stuff, you know, folks on the far right telling us, you know, don't tell the true story. If, if we don't tell the true story, then how are, we, how are we going to be able to understand where we are today if we don't understand where we came from? Oh, just forget that everything happened. If we're not careful about that, we'll find ourselves, tell me if this sounds familiar, with a revolt that happened out of hate that divided the nation and nobody wanted to pay attention to. And as a result, the nation was almost ripped to shreds. Sounds like a January 6th moment to me. So I guess what I'm getting at here is, is it is important to talk about a little bit about who we are as a state. And oh, by the way, there's some interns that are here, and I told y'all I was going to share this with you. Because, because this, is, um, this is out of Senator Merkley's office. Who's a, he's an Oregon senator. And this is relevant to the 13th Amendment. It says this. It says that um, Friday, July 18th, 2021. I guess it's important for us to say dates when there's some kind of proclamation, just in case we catch it two years later or something like that. Um, a June, it says, um, as Juneteenth approaches this weekend, Oregon's U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley and Congresswoman Nakima Williams have introduced the Abolition Amendment which would strike the slavery clause of the 13th Amendment that allows slavery to continue in the United States. Hmm. So, if that happens, when it happens, then, and only then, will we be a nation that does not have slavery 
in this nation. What, is, what, does that, what does that mean? I mean, maybe some haven't quite put it together, but from convict leasing at the end of slavery, when laws were made in different states to criminalize blackness, to criminalize poverty, stop. Why are we talking about poverty? Because the institution of slavery created wealth. The institution of slavery also created poverty. Wealth is generational. Poverty is also generational. So if you look at the numbers and you look at the proportion of blacks who are poor, and you look at the number of white people that are poor, here's a race class mind drill for you, watch this. Most black people are poor, though most poor people are white. Yeah, process, process that for a minute. So overwhelmingly, probably somewhere around, of the 140 million people who are poor, about 60% of all black people are poor. So when you create laws that criminalize poverty, then what you do is, is you get the first and worst impact on black communities. You get a broader, you get a, you, you get a larger impact in numbers in terms of quantity in white communities, but in black communities, the vast majority of that community is impacted. Is everybody with me so far? Okay, so let's talk about our Constitution. Now, in a perfect world, I'd have this slide thing up behind me, and I'd be showing you this. But if you um, are on Twitter, uh, we tweeted it at 2 o'clock, so you can just go and grab it. Even if you're not following us, just uh, search Vermont Allies, Vermont Allies, and then you can just go ahead and, and grab that presentation uh, that's up there, and you can go follow along with me, because it's right there, okay? <clears throat> So we're going to cruise through this, but this is what the Vermont Constitution says. It says that language in the Vermont Constitution, okay, are, this is Article 1. So when I speak to elected officials and they tell me they didn't read it, I ask them what they took the oath to. Because it's Article 1. So you don't have to read very far. It's a, so time me, as a matter of fact, and let me know how long it takes me to get to the part that's problematic. Here I go. As persons born free, their natural rights, slavery prohibited, that all persons born equally free and independent and have certain natural, inherent, and unalienable rights amongst which are the enjoying and defending of life and liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. Therefore, no person born in this country or brought from overseas ought to be holding by law to serve any person as a servant, slave, or apprentice after arriving to the age of 21 years, unless bound by the person's own consent after arriving to such age, or bound by law for payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like. That has been our Constitution for the last 254 years, with small exception. How long did it take me to get to that part? Anybody time me? 35 seconds, okay? So I, I guess, you know, when, our, when the 180 legislators and the five elected um, statewide officials and the three congressional delegation, when they take their oath, maybe they can't pay attention uh, for as much as 35 seconds. I caught it, though, because I was persistent, because I was trying to find out more about me in this document, because it seems like every time we go to the legislature, it seems like it's about everybody else. So I was just trying to figure out, where is the part of the Constitution about us that gives us the protection that we need so we don't have to keep going back every year begging for crumbs? And I found something, but it wasn't quite what I was looking for. So what happened was, in the year before last, Colorado did a very similar thing. Now, we are affiliated with the Abolish Slavery national network uh, that is tied in in support of Merkley's bill uh, that I just read a minute ago. And what we came to understand eventually was is that these constitutional amendments across these states are playing out all across the country. As I said, Colorado did one. Utah just did one uh, as well. Uh, and they're emerging. I won't go through the list. But I just would tell you that 
at some point or another, this conversation does become important. Um, I've heard many people tell me that it's just, oh, it really doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just words. Um, you know, there's really, there's really no slaves today. And I've got some information that would kind of push back on that. Now, here's a spoiler alert. If you don't want to know how the story ends, just go ahead and stuff your fingers in your nose right now. Or not your nose, your ear. <laughs> your nose. Okay, so we at the Racial Justice Alliance, what we were able to do in, in, in 2019 is, is we did start a constitutional amendment. Now, I know this may come as a surprise uh, because, by God, I mean, if there was, and this kind of goes back to that Galveston moment because, you know, if you want to keep something a secret, all you got to do is give one group the power, all the absolute power, and then, and then give them the ability to control the narrative. You'll never hear about it. Hello, Galveston. So that's why you haven't heard about your constitution. That's why you don't know about the fact that this thing is three quarters of the way through the legislative process. That this thing has, it has been in the legislature three years. It's been voted on in the Senate. It's gone to the House. It's had public hearings. It's been voted on in the House. It's come back to the Senate. It's been voted on in the Senate. It's gone back to the House. And you didn't even know about it. Why? Because the narrative is being controlled. That's what I'm here to tell you. That's not very attractive that, 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 we, that we, by God, I've been here 12 years and I'm just as much of a, as a Vermonter as anybody out here, although I'm an Iowan too. Um, but yeah, we got, by God, we could not you know, come to terms with this being like a reality. I mean, cer certainly, what will we tell our children? We've already taught them. I'm off script, but I guess what I'm getting at here is, is that, folks, this is our Constitution. How many people knew what I just told you? Here's the history. 1777, Constitution revised and adopted, 1786 and 1793. Conventions, 1828, 1836, 1850, 1870. Constitution revised by the people, 1888, 1913. Amendment, uh, age change for women. To change the age for slavery for women from 18 to 21, commensurate with that of men, 19. 24. Gender adjustment in 2000 and in 1994. A gender adjustment in the Constitution that quietly removed terms related to freemen. How many people have taken the freeman's oath? Come on, voters. I've only been here 12 years and I've taken the freeman's oath. So that has gone. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, and then there's 27 additional amendments. Um, most recent amendment to the Constitution was 2010. And that language has been largely left intact. In 2016, it was a racial just, it was the uh, verb it was the uh, Justice for All, the organization, one of the organizations that we started, as well as Black Lives Matter. We interviewed a number of Washington County and, yes, your very own Chittenden County um, candidates. And what we discovered is, is very few of them had any knowledge of this uh, um, issue in the Constitution. Uh, the Vermont Democratic Party, um, you know, I'm going to just cop a plea here and say I was, a, I was actually in the leadership in the Democratic Party and was able to um, move that this was put, placed on the, um, the Democratic Party's, um, that it was placed on their platform so that we were successful there. I won't go through all of the details here, but I will say that 
the racial justice reform, our predecessor, the organization that actually turned into us, or we turned into it, um, we asked for the Senate, the Senate leadership, to, and we urged them uh, to, um, we asked them to urge the 2019 Senate to propose a constitutional amendment in 2018. I know it sounds weird, but in 2018, what happened was is that there was an election and we needed to, uh, what we knew that the Constitution would not be able to be amended until 2019 because that's the cycle. It only happens every four years. So what we were able to do is we were able to convince the House to pass a resolution requesting that the Senate the following year take this up because a constitutional amendment can only begin in the Senate. So the House did uh, introduce it, but it died in the House. It was nothing ever became of it. You didn't hear about it either. It is our state history, though, because it's called uh, HR 25 in 2016, and it was the first time in 244 years that a body of our legislature requested that our Senate amend our Constitution to remove slavery. So it's a part of our history, although you don't know about it. So there are many other things that I could tell you about the history, um, but I think suffice it to say uh, that um, if you, like I said, if you go out and you take a look at that presentation, we've tweeted it. Uh, we, you know, we can also get it posted up. We've been very busy. We don't have a lot of things uh, happening on social media today, but we can certainly get that, that PDF slide deck to you. Uh, you can take a look at that. It'll be coming out. Uh, also, if you, um, if you care to, you can also come up and see me after this and scan a QR code that'll take you directly there, okay? I have a QR code on those papers that were blowing away. Uh, so yeah, I um, wanted to um, just give, give some shout outs to the Vermont um, Episcopal Diocese uh, who unanimously approved uh, the release of a letter uh, to the Senate Government Operations Committee supporting uh, this. Uh, uh, this was years ago, so you don't know about it. It happened like two years ago. Uh, also, um, the Governor's Workforce and Equity and Diversity Council uh, unanimously voted in 2019 uh, to approve uh, the language of PR2, uh, and it kind of goes on. So now, I think where I'll take you now is, is uh, just the, the challenges that we had in moving it through is because we thought it would be, you know, without, you know, without issue, and, and actually we had some people pushing back on us. They, we did have some folks on the opposition who, who did believe that, you know, it was perfectly acceptable to have this language in this document. But you didn't see it because that's how they do. Um, and uh, they came into testimony and um, so God bless you, uh, Senator Dick McCormick and, and Professor Peter Teachout uh, for coming in and providing your testimony. We respect your opinion uh, but, and, uh, and, but disagree uh, because there's, uh, we don't believe that there's room in our Constitution. Our Constitution is not a historical document. That's what, uh, that's what libraries and museums are for. Uh, our, our, our Constitution is the bedrock of every, everything that lives and moves in this state concerning law, legality, all branches of this government, and how we, how we rule. That's how, that's how we do, right? So, so anyway, we did get a good draft from the Consul. There's a lot I can tell you about the process along the way. Um, before I'm done, I'm going to tell you more. Um, more about not just history, because people love to come and hear history, and people, you know, and, and I'm sure there's people sitting here right now, they're like, no, uh, -uh. That, that ain't, that, no, uh, uh. What you talking about? No. Yeah. Um, so that's easy to do, uh, but do your homework. Um, but I will say that the, um, the challenges that were associated with trying to get this thing moving and trying to get the attention on it, you know, they were unexpected. They were quite unexpected. Uh, but we, we did, we were able to get this, um, as I said, passed through Senate twice and House uh, another, t another uh, once. This is what you need to know, okay? Now, you'd think I was almost done, but I'm not, okay? Uh, they told me I can talk to you until 7 this evening, so I'm, I'm going to keep going. Okay, maybe not 7, but here's, here's what you need to know. Um, from a procedural perspective, 
What's important is, is that you get on the bus right now, okay? So I know it seems like a long time away, but what's going to happen is, is that the House Government Operations Committee, uh, they are going to have to take into consideration a public hearing on this by Constitution. They must. So I encourage all of you, all of you, uh, to pay attention to what's going on with this uh, process, this procedure, um, to um, engage. Uh, we, the, R the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, we will be making folks, uh, uh, notifying folks on the process and keeping folks aware of the status and updates. Again, if you want to get on the mailing list, uh, I think we got a QR code for that, too. We've got a QR code for everything. So if you want to come and scan and get that, you can, you can just come up to the stage. You can get that done as well. What's going to happen after that is, is that it's going to go to the full Senate. Uh, the full Senate will have to make a vote on it. The last time it came through the full, I'm sorry, full House, the last time it came through the full House, it was 145 to nothing because uh, about five people were checked out. Uh, after it comes back out of the House, what happens is, is it'll go back over to the Senate procedurally. Uh, there'll be some things that need to get done on it, you know, get some I's dotted, you know, ledge console, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then what will happen is, is it will go to the state secretary's office, and it'll be important that the language that we get on that thing is reflective of the, of the intention as well as the actuality of what we're trying to get done with the Constitution itself. The reason why I stress that is because Colorado's first try, they failed. They got this far, and they put it out to the general public. And this is why it's important for you to understand what it is we're doing. The reason why we're doing this is, is to begin to deconstruct systemic racism from the ground up, the bottom, the bottom floor, OK? That is our, that is our intention. It's, it's not about because we were bored and we didn't have anything to do. This language is critically important, and if we are going to talk about dismantling systemic racism, it seems appropriate we would start with the Constitution. How many people believe that? So we had about five recommendations that came forward. Uh, one of those recommendations was to uh, you know, amend the language, the working language that we spoke about. I'm not going to get into language in particular, uh, except for at one point. Another piece of that was about um, in Chapter 42. Everybody's like, Chapter 42, what the hell is this guy talking about? So Chapter 42, uh, just trust me, because Chapter 42 in your Constitution directly undergirds Title 17 of your statutes which has everything to do with voting. Voting. So chapter 42 of the Constitution. So yes, the Constitution, there are different areas in the Constitution that undergird all of our statute. That's why we're having this conversation, for crying out loud. OK? So um, there's some language in 42 that is, it, it, it goes into the term freeman. It says Freeman. Uh, you know, and, and in, the, in the committee, everybody's like, well, I don't know why they were saying Freeman. It beats me. Uh, it just seems like I don't know why they would say that, you know. Uh, I mean, if you've got, if you got Freeman, then you got folks who are not Freeman. You got a Constitution that says you got folks that are considered to be slaves, all framed in the historical context of a nation that was founded in slavery. And you can't tell me what Freeman is. Oh, yeah, but we never had slavery here. We're the 14th state, and we didn't have it. So when we joined the Union, it was all good. Well, you joined a nation that was a racist nation that had slavery. You inherited it. And you had, and in your constitution, the language predated this state's, this nation's constitution by 10 years. By 10 years. This is the granddaddy of all constitutional slavery here in your state, my state. This is what we own. We're fixing it. Okay? So, The other thing is, is we did, we asked them to create a joint resolution. Uh, 
calling for the United States, uh, the United States legislature to uh, amend, rescind, and, uh, and replace the, the 13th Amendment. So I just read to you what Merkley was doing. Remember that? Some people are like, I don't know what you're talking about, Mark. I forgot what you're talking about. I haven't been listening. When's the food here? When's the food? Listen to me. <laughs> I'm almost done. Um, so, um, so, yeah, we did do that. And then what we also asked for, remember Title 17? Does anybody remember Title 17? Okay, my God. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pay you after this. So Title 17, again, which is undergirded by Chapter 42, which is all about voting. We also asked for some changes in that, too, because throughout this title, throughout the language of voting in our statute, Freeman, 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 Freeman. So what we did, and oh, by the way, they never did take on our proposal to amend Chapter 42 of the Constitution, we have to start all over again. It's going to take us another four years to get to that. But we'll come back to that. We got the rest of our lives, right? But this whole thing about uh, 17, chapter, um, uh, Title 17, um, the reason why it's important to embrace what it is we're seeing, and if nothing else, just to understand it and to acknowledge it, is because what it does is it tells us more about our past. It tells us more about the truth of our past. It, it, it tells us more about how, it explains more about how we got to where we are. It is important. It's incredibly important. It's important to change it, but it's also important to tell people when you're changing it and to tell people why you're changing it. Now imagine this. Hypothetically, you're in a state in this state, there is one category of people that have the ability to vote for and be elected as all 180 of those people, all five of the statewide offices, and three of our congressional delegation, and vote for referendums on the Constitution itself. Only that group can do those things. Over years, what would that create? So it is important to understand the existence of these constitutional challenges, but also to begin to drill down into the implications and statutes as well. Okay, so yeah, we did that. And yeah, and even now, if you go to Rule 84 of the Senate, you will find that Rule 84 says, and this is that one general referendum, the last part of a constitutional amendment, it refers to us as freemen. Here's the catcher for those of you who are in Burlington. It's in our charter, too. It's in, it's in our charter, and that's, that's the appendix of Title 24. It's in Virginia's char char charter as well. Have we been talking about it? Yeah. You know, and, and what are people saying about it? I didn't know the gun was loaded. He did it. She did it. They, could, they can take care of it. They're going to take care of it, but nobody's really talking about it. And how many people here knew? Max Tracy? There's one. So why is this so doggone secret? Why is this so secret? Is this, like a matter of is this a matter of national security? So some people say, well, who cares? It doesn't make, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Mark, clearly you are bored and you don't have anything to do and you got so much time on your hands, you're, you're wasting time with all of this other stuff. Well, let's talk about some of the implications. One of those implications is obviously, you know, those people who are incarcerated. Now think about this. Think about this. Just, just think clear-headed for a minute. They're slaves. Period. That's what the Constitution says. They're slaves. In fact, that's what the 13th Amendment says. They're slaves. They were slaves. Even if we didn't say they were slaves, they're slaves. Folks who are incarcerated are slaves. There, I said it. How many people here want slaves? Except for you, ma'am. No, I'm just kidding. How many people want slaves? How many people want to be associated with a state that has slaves? But we have slaves. All of us. We're taxpayers. They belong to us. They're ours. 
Those folks who are incarcerated, they are our slaves. Thank you very much. We have slaves. And so do many other states across the, the United States. In fact, there is a statute, I didn't bring that title with me, that is um, tied into natural, national statute that is, that is um, undergirded with, uh, with a, um, the private pr prison industry. I didn't come completely prepared. Um, but it had created an entity here in the state called Vermont Corrections Industries. Vermont, Vermont Correctional Industries, V-C-I. Vermont Correctional Industries. How many people heard of that? Vermont Correctional Industries. What is that? What is that? There's a statute that says that we can sell the labor of our slaves. That's what it says. Why? Because it's constitutional. I mean, there are slaves. Of course we can do what we want with our slaves. We can sell our slaves labor. Why not have a statute that says that it's OK to sell their labor? Why not, in fact, have a little small business department within the state called Vermont Correctional Industries, and that what we do is, is when you call DMV, you get to talk to a slave. When you put a plate on your car, you get, to you get to deal with the services of a slave. When you visit your government offices and you look at their furniture and you look at their, their, hanging their hangings on their walls, we know that our slaves did that. Is that cool with you? Huh? Human trafficking, over 200, 200 plus inmates slaves that are down in Massachusetts, uh, Mississippi right now. So we took our slaves and we moved them across a state border. What is that? At the beginning of 2017, everybody said, oh my God, they're going to take all the migrant workers out of here. All 1,500 of them, all 1500 of them are going to go and that dairy industry is going to collapse because God knows there's nobody else to do that. So you know what they said? I was there at the table in the state house. Let's train the prisoners. Why not? There are slaves. Department of Children and Family, uh, Woodside, the list goes on. Okay, Woodside's probably closed. The list goes on. Yeah, we're doing that. We're doing that. We can't act like we're not doing that. So is the constitutional language important? Is it important? Because at the end of the day, what we could be saying is, is no. We could be saying no. I mean. Think about Title 13. This guy, everybody says, is this guy a lawyer? No, I'm not a lawyer, okay? Uh, Title 13, not that there's anything wrong with that, okay? Um, but uh, Title 13 says, a person fined for the breach of a penal law or other offenses shall pay such fine or give sufficient security for the same or shall be imprisoned by order of court before which the trial is at hand, before the time the trial is at hand, and provided such blah, 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 blah. If you can't pay your fines, you are a slave. What do you mean I'm a slave? Because, because when they incarcerate you, that makes you a slave. They can incarcerate you if you don't pay these, these fines and debts and, and the like, OK? They can do that, and it's completely justifiable, and, and therefore you are, look, I mean, think about that. This is, this is classic criminalization of poverty. Criminalization of poverty, when you criminalize poverty, who gets hurt first and most? First and worst? Black folks. Systemic racism, that's where we started. That's why we're here. And we're going to stay here. We're going to keep kicking this thing. So that's Title 13. Let's just say if our Constitution said slavery is prohibited under any circumstances. Now, we know that the 13th Amendment says that criminals are slaves, those folks who are deemed criminal. We'll talk about who's making those laws uh, later. That's another subject. It's another class. Who's determining what criminalization who, you know, who decides what criminal is? That's another law. Probably those with power. Um, so what I'm getting at here is, is that this, this law would not stand constitutionally. Does that make any sense at all to you, that this law would not even be constitutional if our Constitution said that slavery was prohibited under all circumstances? 
You pro I know you're probably trying to get your head around that, but it's really not that complicated. Here's what the United Nations said on poverty. They said the United States, this is the United, this is the United Nations. I think sometimes we ought to pay attention to them. This is the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. This was three years ago. It said the United States remains a chronic, it says a chronically segregated society. It says that blacks are 2.5 times more likely than whites to be living in poverty. Their infant mortality rate is 2.3 times that of whites. Uh, their unemployment rate is more than double that of whites. They typically earn 82.5 cents for every dollar earned by white counterparts. Their household, this is the United Nations. Their households earnings are on average well under two thirds of those of their white equivalents and their incarceration rates are 6.4 times higher than those of whites. These shameful statistics can only be explained by longstanding structural discrimination on the basis of race, reflecting the enduring legacy of slavery. The United Nations, three years ago. So we get ready to turn the corner, and I came to tell you something, and I think I did, uh, but I, I want to make sure that I just leave you with something. So if you go to vtracialjusticealliance.org, again, it's vtracialjusticealliance.org, or meet my colleague up at the stage, or me, I don't know. We have a QR code that you can scan. That QR code, uh, we have multiple QR codes uh, that will either direct you for donations, they will direct you for information, they will direct you for God knows who, whatever else is on there. Maybe something you don't even, you're not even interested in. But if you go to our data page on our website, you will see um, you know, where it is depicted that 1.5%, say for example, this population is uh, black. Uh, and maybe 0.2% of farmland is owned by black people in this state. And the list goes on and on and on and on. So, the, and the reason why this is relevant is because what we're talking about is we're talking about a system that is historically created that which it is that we're dealing with. And we have to acknowledge not just the historical context of where we come from as a nation, but we also have to look at the quantitative data that's readily available now uh, for us to take a look at. Because you know, one thing is common about all of the qualitative data, and that is, is that it's consistent that there are disparities across every system. And I don't believe in coincidences like that, especially when you have the historical data that backs up the story of a, a, a history of, of, of racism in America. Um, this impacts our statutes, it impacts our rules, it impacts our institutions, it impacts our government, it impacts our legislature, it impacts our courts. So what I'm telling you here is very important. There are some here who do not hear me and you cannot, okay? Go get something to eat or something like that. For those of you who can hear me and are listening to what I'm telling you, it is incredibly important that you're engaging on issues like this, okay? Systemic racism, when it's defined, it says, and we need to share a common understanding of systemic racism. This is Joe Fagan and Kimberly Ducey. Kimberly Ducey, the book is called Racist America. I guarantee if you get it, maybe you might get an education. It says, systemic racism includes the complex array of anti-black practices, the unjustly gained political economic power of whites, the continuing economic and other resource inequalities along racial lines, and the racist white ideologies and attitudes created to maintain and rationalize white privilege and power. So systemic racism here means pretty much if, if it exists anywhere and it exists, it pretty much exists everywhere. I have another quote for you from the United Nations before I get out of here. It says, there is a profound need to acknowledge 
that the transatlantic trade in, African, in Africans, enslavement, colonization, and colonialism were a crime against humanity. And are among the major sources and manifestations of racism, racial discrimination, Afrophobia, xenophobia, and related intolerances. Past injustices and crimes against Amer African Americans need to be addressed with reparatory justice. In addition to the above, the working group urged the government of the United States of America to consider the ratification of the core international human rights treaties to which the United States is still not a party with a view to removing any gaps in protection and full enjoyment of rights therein. It also encourages the United States to ratify regional human rights treaties and to review the reservations related to the treaties that it has signed or ratified. So just bringing you up to speed that it's easy to look at who we are as a nation from the inside out, but every now and then, you need to stop and take a look at what, what this nation is looking like from the outside in. This is the report of the working group of experts of people of African descent in its mission to the United States of America that was 2016. That is the Human Rights Commission of the Civil, that is the Human, that is the Civil Rights Com uh, Commission, okay? You know what I'm saying, Human Rights Commission. So in conclusion, <clears throat> in our work as we created the racial disparities in the criminal juvenile justice system advisory panel, uh, as, uh, as that work emerged to that um, title, that uh, Act 54 and that report from the, human, the Attorney Generals and the Human Rights Commission that outlined, that outlined racial disparities across all systems of state government, which led to additional work that we've done in the creation of the Racial Equity Executive Director and panel, that position and work, <clears throat> through the work that we've done uh, in moving H210, which is a health equity bill, which recently passed, which is now Act 33, as well as a, a joint resolution of the legislature, which recently passed, and you didn't hear about it, uh, on the 20th, a joint resolution declaring racism as a public health emergency across the entire state. You didn't hear about it, though, did you? We'll tell you more about it because they won't. So um, I got to get out of here, um, but I just wanted to let you know that you know, if you can't wrap your head around this thing any other kind of way, and you're thinking about how we as a state can say we're not going to do something that the United States is doing, say, for example, the 13th Amendment, we don't mind doing that when it comes to immigration. We don't mind doing that. We don't mind turning our eyes the other way when we know that economically there's 1,500 people here who can help us with our, with our um, dairy industry. We like to say it's humanitarian so we can tell ourselves we did a good job, but we don't mind. We don't mind doing that. We don't mind doing that when it's time to, to open up the hemp and cannabis industry. We don't mind doing that because there's money involved. There's some, there's some profit to be made. We don't mind. We know that that's, that's a Title I drug in, on the Federal Register, and, and black people have been going to prison for it and probably will continue to. We don't mind breaking the law with that. We don't mind when it's a right to choice when it becomes about a woman's body, when we say we're going to put a law in place before these guys in the Supreme Court even make a move on us. In fact, there is another constitutional amendment that is called PR5 that is for the rights of women's bodies. It's in place and it should go through the same process that PR2 is going through. You'll see that happen as well. But we didn't hesitate to do that. And we didn't hesitate to tell people about it. But when we want to talk about slavery, for some odd reason, everybody wants to drag their feet or they want to keep it a secret. So what I'm trying to tell you today is, is that this is the linchpin of everything that we're dealing with. Because 
as we continue to unpack all of these policies, we'll find more and more, because how systemic racism works is, is you can't see it until you get right up on it. I really appreciate your time. Those of you who've come, uh, go on our site, look at your Twitter, uh, come up here, get your QR code uh, scan, watch the legislature, watch the work that's happening, that's coming out. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you engaging in the work. Enjoy the rest of Juneteenth. It ain't over. It ain't over because the 13th Amendment still has a loophole in it. It ain't over. We got a lot of work to do. But thank you for being here tonight, folks. Thank you.